What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Surf and Sales Podcast. I am Scott Lease, co-founder and co-host of the Surf and Sales Summit and the Surf and Sales Podcast, along with my good friend and partner, Richard Harris. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. I am very, very good. I, uh, I'm excited for this conversation. I kind of wish we had uh, recorded the the early conversation with our guest because he's just ready to throw smack at us and make us yell at each other. So that's yeah, it. I, I have a feeling he's going to instigate some things. I am realizing what we should have done is filmed this entire podcast with all three of us sitting in an ice bucket. Yes. Ice barrel or ice tub or whatever at the same time. I'm sure we'll get into that. Our guest today is Alex Kramer. He is currently a uh, sales leader over at Catalyst Software. He's also the founder of Alluviance. And uh, he just moved to Austin, Richard. He's sort of my neighbor now. And he, he's got this event coming up called Arise Immersion Weekend, November 10th through 12th in Austin, Texas. So I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing all my friends here, Richard. It's just You're the only one who doesn't want to leave wherever you're at. Well, that's just the way it is. You haven't enticed me enough, you know. So you're, you're 15 years in, into your seduction, and oh, well, you know, your magic just doesn't work on me. Some people are early adopters. Some people are just curmudgeons, and I, I, I am the audience an early adopter. Who's who? Tell everybody about uh, our wonderful sponsor, HubSpot. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Q4 is here, right? And and as they say in sales, you know. Q4 in football is where the magic happens, unless, of course, you're a Denver Bronco fan and it seems like all their opponents have magic every other quarter, every quarter, because it's just painful for me. Um, That's a great reference. I I love that reference. Yeah. That was good. That was really good. So, uh, so anyway, so on behalf of HubSpot, uh, I want to talk about their sales hub. uh, And we know that it's Q4 coming in um, in the next, you know, in the next week. And then, ongoing through the rest of this year, it's where the games are won. We know that. That's where people who are really making up the revenue, really trying to hit their numbers, get to their president's club, whatever it is. It's where the champions are made. And it's where sales teams and sales people become legends, like Scott refers to himself as the legend. Uh, and that's why HubSpot built the sales hub, not for Scott, uh, but to help all the other sales reps and their deal making. Uh, and it's got a ton of tools in there to help you for Q4. Um, sales hub has a prospecting workspace that organizes your schedule, your goals, all your to-do lists in one place, uh, saves your team, your team, a ton of time, uh, which is, you know, the most precious commodity we all have. And it has smart sequences to help reps close their deals faster than ever. So get ready to dominate Q4 with sales hub from HubSpot, And you can learn more about it at hubspot.com slash sales. They finally got a short one, hubspot.com com slash sales so check them out scott there you go I i'm glad they got a short url i'm glad they got a short url because that commercial is anything but short yes well the the self-proclaimed i am a legend by scott is a pretty impressive but this has never happened before the only thing that i would proclaim to be a legend at is the uh original tecmo super bowl on nintendo i will wreck people's shop in that all right, so well, you and the, the show, Alex Kramer. How's it going, buddy? You and the one other person in the world who is a legend at that game. That's quite impressive. I'm doing phenomenal. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Alex, are you even old enough to know? What That's the thing. He just insulted me because he's a child who has never played this game before. Right. I'm, I might be younger than you, although my maturity is just off the charts. It's it's insane. Uh, so so I'm a, you're, my, you, you're a self-esteem <laughs> legend. I'm a self-claimed very mature person here. Right. There, there we go. Tell everybody about um, what you're up to with the uh, events and the Luvians and Catalyst software so they have an idea of uh, your background. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me on. It's just good to, to banter with both of you guys. I, I love listening to the show. Um, so I have been in tech sales now for you know close to 15 years. I started out at the early days of uh, my career at Microsoft. I was at DocuSign. Uh, I was at Outreach for about five years, built out that company in partnership with quite a few people moved to New York, helped uh, open up our New York office. Now I, uh, I lead our sales team, uh, our SDR and our AEs at Catalyst uh, and building a next unicorn, I guess you could say. Uh, in addition to that, so I am the founder of Alluviance. Uh, Alluviance essentially uh, is a community that's focused on tech sales professionals and leaders 
really to first off perfect the art and the craft of sales uh, slash influence, I guess you could say, while also complementing that with the inner game. So really helping people gain clarity on what is our vision, what is the unique flavor that you are bringing to the world, uh, and maybe even uh, excavate some of the imposter syndrome, the self-doubt sort of stuff that you go through, uh, through different things like breath work, meditation, cold plunges, which we talk a lot about cold plunges and all that sort of good stuff. Um, but I think, you know, really why, why uh, Alluvians is around and why we throw our immersions is, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys agree with this, but it feels like when you look at 2016 through 2020, 2021, it was like the golden age of tech. It felt like everybody had budget. Everybody was hitting quota. It was a grow at all costs sort of world. And then COVID hit. And it seems like paradigms have shattered quite a bit where now not only are people more stressed, people are more anxious, people are burnt out more than ever. Everybody's working from home, selling a product they may or may not care about, trying to hit a quota that may or may not be attainable. And even if people are performing at an extremely high level, they're still asking themselves the, why the hell am I doing this? Like, what is the purpose of me working at this job and, and trying to make money around this? And so, you know, I think the whole goal is how do we give people first off more community so they're not working from home uh, all by themselves? And also how do we give people more meaning so they feel like what they are working and developing into uh, is part of something bigger right there. And so, that's part of my mission, and I try to do that both at Catalyst as well as through Luvians and talking to two, you know, great-looking guys here on this podcast. Why well, he's trying to butter us up now? He's right. He's he's just, just lay, he's just he's destroying. just laying the groundwork for when he drops like big grenade on us. There it is. Uh, you don't know which which part of me you're going to get. I mean, nice. I mean, let's uh, let's start off with your incredible track record of picking successful companies to join this is this is a skill in my opinion a skill in and of itself and one could argue um the top three skill to have if you want to have a successful career i mean would you say like you did anything in particular in the vetting process or networking your way in and targeting those companies or are you just like dude i got lucky <laughs> I mean, I'd always say you create your own luck. Um, you, I think the the easiest way I'll describe it is, first off, my claim to fame in college is I was the president of the sales club. So that was just one of the coolest I'm, parts wait, of my life. And, it's, sales, and it's, it's gone downhill. Sales club in college? Hold on. There was a sales club in college. We were big. We had like 80 paying members. It was I was kind of like the big dog president of the sales club on campus. Like when I walked around, people were like, hey, are you the president of the sales club? I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> was, this, was, this, was this like a big, a, a little teeny tiny liberal arts school? Or was this like one of those? Oh, this guy went to UW. He's a Pac-12 uh, Pac guy like us. Come on, man. Go dogs. Yeah. So that's fascinating that there was a sales club. I never would have thought of that. So, yeah. Well, there was, yeah. there was a sales, there was a sales major too. Uh, you could get a certificate in sales. You took like legitimate sales courses talking about how to do prospecting, how to do effective discovery, how to use Salesforce and outreach and LinkedIn sales navigator. Like I would say university of Washington pioneered, you know, a lot of the get a sales degree. And I think I, I kind of got lucky because I went right to Microsoft and became an account executive right out of college, you know, being in Seattle, being the president of the sales club, like it just kind of it yeah, supported it. me getting there. So I wouldn't say, I guess you could call that creating your own luck, but I was, you know, at the right place at the right right time on, on getting that opportunity. Well, I do I do know that that of the universities, I think there's about three or 400 of the 4,000, they have like a sales degree that's not just sales and marketing. And I know those, all those students get recruited pretty early yeah. for the reason. So I, I, I don't know that you created... I mean, you chose wisely. I don't. I don't think it was. I don't think it's a mistake that you landed or luck that you landed at Microsoft. You you did all the right things, and and it was the right place. But come back to Scott's question of how. To, so okay, so Microsoft. Okay, that makes sense, right? Coming out of sales, you're in you're in Seattle. That's there. Why not? But then you go to some other places that are equally successful. So how I got the job at Outreach. Um, I think is a is a pretty cool little story. It's a reframe about how many people think about what's their next job. And so 
after being at Microsoft for about four years, I was saying, okay, you know, I'd been top performer on my team, been making a ton of money from the outside looking in, you would have said, wow, Alex, you're fully crushing it. But there was a part of me that said, am I actually good at sales or are they just simply buying from me because I have an at Microsoft.com email address and because Microsoft is a really reputable company. And that was an insecurity of mine straight up. And so I really wanted to go to a place that uh, I get knocked in the teeth just a tiny bit. Like I would say, like, am I actually a really strong sales professional? And when I was thinking about what the next step it was that I was going to do, I was thinking, okay, is it, you know, is it a, a sales role? Is it a sales leadership role? Is it, you know, revenue? Is it marketing? Like, what is it? What What's that next step I'm going to do? Is it going to be in a finance type of company? And I was actually, I was really hitting my head on a ceiling of what is it that I want to be doing? And so I ended up actually changing the question that I was asking myself when I was thinking about my next role. So as opposed to what do I want to do, I chose to say, how do I actually want to feel at my next role? Like, what are the important aspects of my next role that I care about? And I did like a lot of deep kind of soul searching. And, and I'm a big person who's into meditation and going on retreats and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I came up with three main things that I really cared about. First off, I wanted to be extremely challenged. I wanted to move my identity from being just a great sales rep to really being a great sales professional, one who, you know, knows the frameworks, the tactics and strategies that says, hey, insert product or service here. And I know I will be successful because I've done this before. So I really wanted to be challenged in that role. The second thing, I really wanted a phenomenal culture. Like I'm not saying Microsoft has a bad culture, actually has a great culture, but just based on my team, it felt a little bit like it was just a bunch of individual contributors who happened to be reporting to the same manager. Like I wanted a crew, like I wanted to go into an office. I wanted a fist bump in the morning. I would say, Hey, let's fucking get after it today. Like that was an important aspect that I really cared about. And number three, uh, I want an opportunity for leadership, whether it was right away or get somewhere and be able to work my way up. And so I knew that that was kind of the, the, that was the lens through which I was looking at my next opportunities. And so I was interviewing at a whole bunch of places, interviewed at Salesforce, at Amazon, at LinkedIn. Um, and I ended up, it was really weird. It was like, I was looking online at like series B, series C companies. And I remember I pulled up the outreach LinkedIn and outreach at that point was like a hundred to hundred employees, 120 employees. And there's just something that like kind of in my gut was like, this feels good. Like just like looking at it, the colors looks good. And I was like, let me kind of pursue this more. And I ended up getting the interview and I remember walking into the office and just my gut was just like, oh, this is it. Like just this feels like a place like it's selling a sales engagement platform. So I'd be selling to sales leaders. I knew that I would be extremely challenged. Like that would hold me to a really high standard. Um, just the buzz in the office was incredible. I mean, you had people like Mark Cosiglo, Manny Medina. I mean, all these incredible sellers and leaders out there who were just like ready to get after it. Um, and I was like, hey, this is a 100 to 150 person company. Like there will be an opportunity for leadership. Um, and so I went in there and, you know, I was there for uh, a year and uh, I ended up getting AE Rookie of the Year. I absolutely loved it. And I remember actually on my very first day uh, at Outreach, I went up to Manny Medina, the CEO, and I was like, hey, Manny, just so you know, like I'm going to be a leader here. And he's like, cool, go close, go close some revenue. <laughs> he's like, talk, yeah, yeah, well, I've heard that long ago. Go close some revenue. Right. Uh, right. That's a really, I, great, it's a really great framework that the three, um, yep. three steps, the stages. I, I, I never did anything that intelligent or smart. I was going to say, I think, it, it, you know, a long time ago, I, I, I looked at the, okay, I'm taking this job as a, stepping stone to the next job. What do I want that next job to be? But I never defined it. And I certainly never looked at culture and I certainly never looked at those other things. So I think this is, this is the, this is one of the reasons I love working with and learning from, from people who are, you know, a few decades younger than me, because they, they have this ability to do it. And I think you've, you know, you've grown into this world, like the world, you have more access to think about this kind of stuff as opposed to me as a Gen Xer who was like, you know, taught to just you know, shut the fuck up and just get on the phone. Right. Uh, which is kind of what Manny yeah. said, but you know, that's okay. Manny's allowed. Uh, I want to know, know, I want to know what worked then that is no longer working now when you're a catalyst. In terms of like what worked at outreach that yeah. no longer works at catalyst. Yes. 
Yeah. In how you sold, in how you grew the team, how have you had to adjust? Those? Yeah. It's a good question. You know, I mean, when you th even think about outreach as a company and also even just what outreach sold, like we were slinging sequences, man. Those things were fire. Like yeah. that was when the, that was the, the golden age of the BDR and the SDR. And it was like, Hey, we got like, I remember in the initial meeting, the climax of the presentation was, and this is what a sequence does. And everybody was like, Oh my God, that's incredible. I've been looking for something like this. I'm like, yeah. And it's really good. Like we can tell you people are opening it or clicking it or responding to it. And they're like, Oh my God, this is incredible. So it was a little bit more of the spray and pray, like just, Hey, get all your contacts and add them to a sequence and it would work. And, um, you know, it's now gotten to that point, like with chat GPT and everybody and their mother has a, some form of a sequence and that doesn't work any longer. In fact, it's actually negative. It's like causing people to not respond to your end up getting blacklisted. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest things that used to work that now, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I lead our SDR team. I talk with Mark about this all the time. It's like, how are we still building pipeline with the SDR role? Because outbound, I feel like is harder than ever. The only avenue that I still see significantly working is cold calling. But that even in of, of itself is a very controversial subject because I don't know if cold calls are even working any longer because people are getting so many calls every single day. Well, I also There's think too, avenues. yeah, it's, I think it's the old school cycle of, you know, what's old is new again, which we hear, you know, that silly buzz phrase. And, um, you know, the cold calling is harder too, because people don't have desk phones anymore. Right. Like. I remember when I first realized people were not having, like, what do you mean you don't have a desk? It was like, no, you just use your cell phone or you just use, you know, you know, a soft phone or something like that. So that, you know, the technology has done that. So it, it is, there's a massive reset happening to your point, a yeah. massive, massive reset um, that matters. I'm curious, sort of going back, like, did you always know you wanted to be in sales? Like what's the origin? Like, were you, were you the hustler as a kid? Right. Like, no, you know, as Scott, as Scott says, like, you know, I'm one of the few people Scott knows who knew they wanted to go into sales. Right. Clearly in college, I knew I was doing business, but I didn't, and I took business classes, but I would never have thought to look for a sales major or form a sales club and be a writer. So that's exactly. So, you know, where did that come? Where did that entrepreneurial spirit come from for you? You know what's really interesting? I actually don't consider myself to be that good at sales. Like I, I like when I think you're, of some, you have really good hair. Or, you're very, you have good hair and you're handsome, so you don't. We need to good. I need to explain that more. You don't consider yourself to be very good at sales. So here's what I here's how I'll, I'll frame it. So Richard, I would assume that for someone like yourself, you strike me and Scott, you too. You strike me as a very good sales person. It's like, hey, sell me this you know, the classic, sell me this pen or sell me that. And I, I bet you I can break the pen. You <laughs> need a new pen. Exactly. Oh, I you need a new pen. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Like, it's exactly like that. Like you got the gift, like the gift of gab, you know how to do it and you know how to enroll people into it. And that's, that's a powerful ability to have. I personally was never the guy of like, just let me talk to them and let me get it done. For me, the thing that I feel like I've always just been really good at is simply connecting with people. Like I, I'm not going to get up there and like, oh, I'm going to turn him from a no to a yes by the end of the conversation. I'm going to get there. I'm just going to connect with the person, show that I'm an actual, you know, good hearted person and be genuinely interested in them. And then hopefully that will just build a certain level of trust and credibility that will want them to continue to have a conversation with me. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my favorite questions to ask after it's about the third meeting that I'm having with a prospect is I say, like, let's say I was talking to you, Scott, but like, Hey Scott, you've now contributed about three to four hours worth of time to having a conversation with us. Now I understand what the priorities are that your company is trying to hit. I understand some of the pains that you might be experiencing, but like, I'm going to take off my catalyst hat here. If you want to take off your insert company here hat, like, why the fuck are you talking to me so much? Like, why do you actually care about this? Like, I, I actually want to know, like, what would be a win, not just for your company, but what would be a win for you? Because that's 
truly would I care about there? And what, what's crazy is just like the mere fact that I'm asking that question, but I'm also, I'm, I'm not saying it to like, let me manipulate this person to figure out how I can get them to buy into this. Like, I actually want to know right there. I actually want you to win personally. And and the answers that come from that, whether it's, I want to get a promotion, I want to help support my team, whatever it might be. I say, okay, let's get that win and the company. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you because this is what I do. Right. So first of all, I love the fact that, that you said that Scott and I seem to have this gift for Gab and you've probably talked in Dolly. Well, you were saying gift of Gab. You have to be gift of Gab. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the guest on your podcast. Aren't I supposed to be doing the talk? Of course. And like, you know, we met Richard. He just wants you to be here so he can listen to himself talk and you can listen to it. All the time. All the time. So that being said, all it's interesting to your, your self-analysis that you don't think you have all those things that you define as sales, but all the things you just described are all the things that I, you would define as sales. So it's, it's, it's an interesting analysis of how we all see ourselves. It's also an initial, it's also a good analysis of, uh, the way that we view sales as a profession and sellers and salespeople and that evolution, because there's still this old archetype of the gift of gab, the person who's like, I'm going to flip this person. I'm going to close this one, no matter what on. And that whole kind of like super type a extroverted type person. I'm not that person. Alex is sort of saying he's not that person, but you know, Richard is archetype that Richard maybe was that person, but that old school type of seller, that style and, and, uh, those taxis don't really work anymore. They're certainly frowned upon, right? And your style, as you described it, as I was listening, all the things you were saying, I'm like, well, that's exactly why you're a good seller. Exactly. Totally. But I, w- I want to come back to my question, which prompted this, which was, were you, you know, were you hustling the lemonade stand as a kid? Were you, you know, I sold candy at, in, you know, grammar school, you know, you know, as my side hustle, that was my first side hustle selling Jolly Ranchers, you know, were you that kind of kid or were you, I was not, I was too busy playing sports. So what made you choose it though? Right. So you somewhere in your head, you decided sales seems like something I'm interested in where so many other people in sales fall into it after doing a hundred other things. You just, you chose it early in college. What yeah. made you, what, what was that light bulb moment for you? So I had the wonderful opportunity of growing up, uh, and watching both my father and my mother, they were motivational speakers growing up. Uh, my dad, my dad is a, is a doctor by trade, but you know, um, if you're familiar with Amway, he, him and my mom used to work at Amway and they used to be speakers at Amway. So I used to go to conferences all the time growing up and watch them speak. And a lot of free fucking toothpaste. Oh man. A lot of a lot of free sales training. Right. <laughs> That's a good amount right there. And uh I always aspire to do that myself. You know, I always, you know, it's still a dream of mine is to be on stage and um, you know, to be leading transformational experiences to help people feel called to do something more, to be something greater, to, you know, find meaning in this world. And I knew that two things that are really important for that. I know I need to learn how to just be good with people and I need to become a great speaker. Like that's just like the two like parts of the trade right there. And so I thought sales and getting to Microsoft is like, Hey, selling a reputable product, you know, selling to pretty much every single industry. This is only going to open up doors that will allow me to develop those skill sets right there. Uh, And the rest is history. Scott, I will say one thing though, because you asked a question to you that I wanted to answer as well. You said, what is one thing that's changed from yeah. Outreach Catalyst? This is a controversial uh, topic maybe, but I think people are not motivated by money any longer. Okay, let's pause right here. Yes. <laughs> take, us to, take us to the mid-roll, uh, tell us a little bit more about what's going on. And then Alice is going to repeat that and we're going to dive into that in just a second. Absolutely. As soon as I can find the mid roll, the good, the good news is, is that the mid roll for today for HubSpot is the HubSpot podcast network and our friend, John Barrows. Uh, if you don't know, uh, John Barrows and you're in sales, I don't know who you are. Um, how could you not? He's probably, you know, to coin a phrase, a catalyst for a lot of us to 
become successful. We've all known him for a long, long time or known of him. Um, he's got a great podcast called Make It Happen Monday. So please check out John. He has great guests, great stories. Um, and it's, you know, there's always a wealth of knowledge with, with John and the Make It Happen podcast. So check him out at the HubSpot Podcast Network. Scott, let's go back to this no longer motivated by money. Okay, let's just have Alex repeat exactly what he says so we don't miss paraphrase. Say it one more time. So if you ask me, what's the difference between, you know, the 2015 through 2020 era to now where we are at, one of the biggest differences is I think people are no longer motivated by money, at least as much as they used to, that they are as compared to where they're at now. Okay, so he he qualified it a little bit, but with the as much as I know, that's you got what I was wondering. <laughs> okay, so so his experience only goes back that far, Richard. So mm -hmm. I want you to rewind the tape. I'm going to flip this to Richard for a second. Go back to let's call it uh, the year 2000 to 2011. This is the pre-Alex uh, working in tech years. Are people in 2000 to 2011? more motivated by the money than the 2012 era of Alex. And then is that era more motivated, more motivated by money than the present era today? Is this a trend is what I'm trying to get at? Well, I think it's yes. And the reason for that, I think is generational, right? So, you know, I was a gen, I am a gen X and from 2000 to 2011, uh, you know, I was, late twenties, early thirty, or into my mid thirties. And I was being taught what was above me, which was the boomers, money, 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 money. Right. Um, I also, you know, we worked in sales roles that were built like that. Like I, I worked for, for lack of a better phrase, like I never even realized that I was working for a startup before I even really understood what startups were, but it was an old school. It was run like a startup. It was not a startup technology. Uh, so I think that is there. What shifted with the millennials is the creation of value beyond money, right? What is the value? What is the purpose? What is all, what are all those things? Because, you know, Gen X, we were slackers. We didn't care. We were called the slacker generation, right? As much as every generation above it bashes on the other, you know, that's the piece. And the millennials really came along and turned it really upside down on its head. Right. And I think have accomplished what so many Gen Xers wished we, you know, what we were thinking, but were afraid to try. So I think generationally it happened. Um, and so I think that the other values of life happened, you know, from 2011 ish to 2020. And then when the pandemic hit, everybody else got on board. Oh, mental health matters, all this other stuff. And now we're seeing this shift again. That's, you know, there's a tug of war between the old school, go back to the office and the new school of go fuck yourself. You know, why would I do that? <laughs> you know, um, and the challenge that I still see is money may not matter, but the population change just from a numbers perspective, as the boomers retire, we're finally, finally at that place where there's just not enough people to backfill the role. So the 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 salaries are going to increase, but situationally, not necessarily out of greed. And look, once everybody's offered more money, they're going to take it, they're going to want it, but they're still going to want their other values too. They're not going to sell their soul like I think the rest of us did. That's a long answer, but that's my interpretation. I need evidence from Alex of um, the modern seller not caring about money as much. So I'll give more anecdotal evidence if that's okay. By the way, I agree with you. I just want to hear your explanation. So I think when you look at where people are at right now, money is definitely important. Don't get me wrong. But Money is now abundant in many different ways. Everybody has some sort of side gig or is posting on Instagram or becoming a LinkedIn influencer that's generating money for their $97 white paper on this nine steps on how to prospect, something like that. Like it's just, there's so many different ways to do it. 
it's no longer being required to get a corporate job, get a W-2 in order to earn a living. Yeah. And yeah. that's the big difference. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. the big so difference. it's not that money doesn't matter as much anymore. It's how they earn it doesn't matter as much. Yeah. I will take a role over here that pays me enough, but gives me the flexibility to do all this other stuff, which is really what I want to do long term. And I can supplement this lesser salary over here and actually exceed earnings. You see what I'm saying? That, that's the bit that I think um, is nuanced and perhaps a little misleading if we just say money doesn't matter. As much. It's, it's so they where are they earning? So the, the interesting piece is, and I haven't shared this with you, Scott, because I just read it yesterday. Stanford has done this study. I've been talking a lot about work from home and going to the office and, you know, stirring the pot a lot to, to get people to think about it. There's a, a study that says people will work from home and take about $8,000 less in money than the, getting the extra $8,000 and going to the office that your happiness is worth about eight grand because and both of your points, gas if you live in San Francisco. Right. And to your point, to both your points, well, I can make up that eight grand on my side hustle or, yeah. you know what? I don't have to worry about, you know, eating out as much or I'm home for my kids and that makes me happier. Like there is, people are actually trying to quantify this. So there is a number out there that I read about, um, which, which aligns with, with what you're saying. But the reason this is so important, Alex, is for people like you who are managing reps, who are hiring reps, for founders who are building companies and trying to recruit in other executives who are in their 20s and early 30s who, who feel and think this way. That's a big shift. And, and people in leadership roles have to be aware of that. Right. So, so the question that becomes is what is actually replacing the money that people care about? Like, what is the new priority people are placed on? And in my opinion, there's two things that people care about. And I think it's a really good point of like, as founders and managers, like how do you motivate your team? People want two things. People want purpose slash meaning and people want community. Like if you have those two things, you are going to get a majority of people say, damn, I am down to join this cause right here. People want to feel like they are not just doing something that is futile, that they're just going, they're clocking in, they're clocking out because that's going to be shallow and it's going to what going to be what causes the burnout or the loneliness. Like people want to feel like, hey, my life is actually changing the world as grandiose as that seems. Like I am actually making a difference so that the torch that I am carrying that I was passed down from my ancestors, I'm going to be able to pass down to future generations to make this world a better place. So if you want that, and people just want a group of people that they feel like they can call their crew. Like people want to say like, hey, these are my homies. Like we're going to, I don't like the term going to battle, but we're getting after it together. We're all aligned towards this common goal. And when I'm struggling, they got my back. And also they're holding me to an extremely high standard. Like they're calling me forward. There's a greater level of accountability in this community to serve something greater. I think that's the key thing that people are looking for these days. And yeah, by the way, if you do that, hopefully the byproduct of that is you're going to make a shit ton of money and then you're not going to have to worry about that. Totally agree. Dude, this is, holy cow, it's 45 minutes. Um, and I hate, we don't have to change the subject, but this is the part where we like to turn it over to you to see what questions you have. Um, but, uh, I, I really enjoyed this last part of the, I mean, I've enjoyed the entire thing, but that last, this last piece about motivation and money is, is interesting. What questions do you have for, for me or Scott? So this is a question that I've been asking myself a lot and it's, it's in line with what our conversation has been is what's happening to the corporate world right now? Like, well, Holy shit. I, <laughs> like actually though. Uh, especially when I look at in the tech world, like, and when I talk to every, every sales rep out there, or every sales leader is like, I don't know what's happening. Like, this is really hard. This is harder than it's ever been. And leaders are struggling more than ever. And so it's like the corporate world is still a very important part of our society. It's what makes money go around that provides opportunities, but it's struggling, at least from what I can say. So what's happening and what, what do we need to do to actually 
fix, solve, improve it. There's a million different directions to go with that. Um, let me just maybe try to take one. Um, I don't know if it's so much as what's happening in the corporate world as what's happening in tech and in SaaS. And I think sometimes those of us who are in tech and in software get blinders on and think that what's happening to us is what's happening to everywhere else. There's a, a lot of sectors that don't have this same kind of struggle or slowdown in right now. Education, for example, government, for example, I have a couple of clients who are selling into these areas and they're like killing it. Um, I don't know if that's unique to them, but I'm just going to assume it's not for the purpose of this, uh, conversation. So that's one thing that, that I think about. Um, I think that whatever trust there was between employer and employee is essentially gone. I have no less than 10 DMS in my inbox right now on LinkedIn from a post I made this morning, just talking about, you know, gently stirring the pot a little bit, make sure you find the right kind of companies to go to 10 stories that are horrific, unsolicited. And I'm, and I had the reaction to you, the same reaction of you of, of like, what the hell is going on? How is this stuff kind of <clears throat> still happening? So I think that employees, because they have more access to community, because they have unique access to monetize their skill sets now, because so many of these horror stories have become transparent and coming to the light. I don't think they look at employers as somebody who's there uh, to serve them and to help them, nor do they look at it as long-term at all. They look at it as something they have to do in order to acquire said thing, which propels them to be able to do this other thing. So employees are now using employers the way employers have always used us. So there's no trust left between either party. And that makes it extremely difficult to uh, build a successful team and a winning culture and all of that kind of thing. And the third point that I'll bring up is we built a lot of pointless, worthless shit. We over-engineered everything. We thought just because we can build it means we should build it. And like is normal human nature, we create something and then we destroy it through overuse, right? When the phone stopped working as much as a channel because power dialers showed up and could call 500 numbers all at the same time and leave automated voicemails, all this. Email showed up. Then you guys at Outreach and everywhere else, people use that technology, even if it wasn't your intention, they use that technology as a spam cannon and started sending 500 emails out all, all the time. So we ruined what was good by exploiting it and trying to squeeze every inch of productivity out of it. And so people just started building companies that are actually this small little widget and raised a bunch of money based on this widget and they cannot bring a return to their investors and they can't turn that into a hundred million dollar company, let alone a billion dollar company. So now they're chasing the dragon. You got all these crazy expectations on everybody. And it's now is not the time to be trying to sell some nice to have little widget. You're going to get crushed. So a lot of people lose their gig. Those three things are the, are the biggest things that I see happening right now in terms of what the hell is going on out there? Richard. Well, I think we're out of time. That was really nice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's you want to time for your own rant. Go. Yeah. I was going to say, it's it, it's nice to hear Scott go on a rant. It's always fun when he does that stuff. And uh, and and he's always accurate. So I, I don't disagree. At a, at a high level, and I think this is one of the things that speaks to you, Alex, and, and the way you you view all of this and what you're trying to, what you are accomplishing, I mean, you're not trying, you're accomplishing is that humanity has been turned on its head since about 2016, right? Where um, 
the abrasiveness of culture, the transactional belief of human to human, as Scott was talking about, um, has just sort of overtaken, right? And there was a brief glimpse. There was a glimpse from April of 2020 to 2022 of, wow, companies are starting to get it. Executives are starting to get it. Uh, they understand the humanity. They understand mental health. They understand that it's more than this. And again, I don't think any of that would have happened, not just because of the pandemic, but also because of what the millennials have been saying. I mean, all in the 20 teens, it was all about, well, the company better have a purpose, right? Like you mentioned that earlier, Alex, right? There's So y'all have been pushing and pushing and pushing and people are getting it that, that, that there needs to be a purpose. Pandemic hit, craziness, elections, craziness, and we started to get back to normal or to a better normal with the humanity piece. And now all of a sudden that went out the window. This year, you know, the greed kicked back in and humanity no longer mattered in sales and in life. And now that we have AI, you know, we're already, you know, seeing that humanity removed and we're already seeing executives by, if you think they're not, they're definitely saying, gosh, how could we use AI to increase sales? Well, guess what that also means? It means decrease overhead, which means fewer jobs, right? Like, so it's already happening, right? Is it also, you know, the work from home versus return to office, right? Depending on what study you, you, you want to listen to about productivity. So it's all about the humanity. That's that's the big thing that I'm seeing um, that is escaping because we're all chasing, to Scott's point, that dragon, right? The, the brass ring of revenue. And so that's that's the big piece that I see at a, at a high level. Um, and then, you know, sort of seeing where Scott's talk about it at a ground level. Uh, well said. So the, the, the only thing I'll, I'll comment for both of you guys is... Um, yeah, we're at like a massive inflection point right now. It's yeah. very, it's very, it's going to be, I got, we, we all got a front row seat to see what the hell is going to happen. Um, and it could be good. And I mean, the interesting thing is we're just finally going through what all other industries have gone through, right? The farming industry went through this automotive manufacturing and factory workers. They went through this decades ago. It's now just coming to us and we're all freaked out about it because now it's our turn. Um, and so it's it's interesting to think that we never, I don't know if we never 